Hebrews, the 10th chapter, we'll begin at verse 19. <coughs> Here is the reading of God's word for the sermon on the Lord's Day morning. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he inaugurated for us through the veil, that is, his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean for an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembly together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. This is the reading of God's word for the sermon and the church said, Amen. Well, I've had a great joy in uh, bringing to you part one of this Back to Basics uh, short sermon series, focusing especially on the matter of church membership. Well, even before the completion of my sermon, today is part two, I've already had a number of people saying to me how particularly blessed they were, challenged, encouraged, and uh, uh, set their minds straight on what it means to be a member. Already questions of their own mind have been answered. I do hope even this morning that uh, those questions you, that you may have may uh, be, in, be answered even this morning in the sermon. And uh, I'll just give you a brief recap and then we'll focus on this morning's sermon. Well, I laid the foundation last week. I took you on a journey and uh, to, this morning we'll continue on that journey. We made it very clear that uh, church membership is not something that people are readily speaking about. It's a matter, I think, that people are ministers, a lot of ministers are scared to approach. Uh, And so we, um, so so ministers then tend to have a very casual approach to what it means uh, to be an attender or a member of a church. I do believe that church membership is an important thing in the life of a believer. And I've made the case last week, you can go back and listen to that sermon if you've missed it last week. We've made it very clear that we live in a certain type of culture now that just expects everything we want. On instant. You can order something on Amazon and have it the same day. And so we're getting used to a particular type of culture that wants everything we want at a particular time with less effort from our part. At the click of a button, sitting on our sofa, we can get something delivered right to our door, either within an hour or within a day or within a few days. So therefore, there's no effort on our part. I call this the the, the drive-through culture. And somehow the drive-through culture has permeated the church, has affected the church in such a way where a lot of people who are church attenders view church like that. It's a drive-through culture. Let me just drive through and have something sprinkled upon me that I can go and say, uh, I'm I'm now blessed of the Lord. Let me just drive through something and take what I can and just go on with the rest of my day, the rest of my journey, and so forth and so on. In some cultures, like for example where I come from in South Africa, they have a 7 o'clock morning service. And the reason why they have a 7 o'clock morning service is not because of any sort of sacrifice that they're making to get up early and and have a 7 o'clock morning service. The reason why they have a 7 o'clock morning service is because they want to go out shopping the rest of the day. They want to do other things the rest of the day. And so uh, that uh, that plays into what it means to have the Lord's, uh, to observe the the Lord's day. Um, But also I say that in the sense of uh, the drive-through culture. Let's create things, let's organize services where people can just drive through and not play any particular part in it. As I made it very clear last week, there are people within the church uh, who, uh, who will very easily walk through the doors and have somebody greet them at the door and say, welcome to church. But in no possible way will they think about, can I be that person standing at the door shaking that hand? Uh, who opened the door? Who cleaned the toilet? Who opened the windows? Uh, who made the tea and coffee? Uh, uh, you know, who is contributing to the prayer. And so you find that very often folks in the church don't think that way. Well, sometimes they do think that way, but they don't want to get involved in it. They don't want to get involved in the life of the church. Why? Because it requires a responsibility, an accountability, and a commitment. And so because of those things, we don't do well with those things in life. As soon as you have something that deals with accountability, responsibility, and commitment, we run from it. In fact, the generation that we live in and the generation that your children are being raised in right now and the, and the children after them will know nothing of accountability, responsibility, and commitment. We see that all the time. We see that in the way they do their homework. We see that in the way uh, uh, they do their projects and assignments. We see that in the way they look at the world. There is no responsibility, accountability, and commitment. 
And compared to previous generations, we raised men and families and women who knew what that was. And not just within the church, but also outside the church. There was that, uh, that, that, that idea, that philosophy that went through people, that we have to be accountable and responsible and committed. But not so today. And we find much of that has permeated through the church. And, through, and it brings about a detriment, a, a loss, not a profit to the church, but a loss. I say to you, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, church membership is a profit to the church. It's of benefit to you and brings glory to the Lord. And as we began last week, I said, we're going to examine and ask the crucial questions. Do I know what church membership is? One of the questions I raised before you. Is church membership, membership a biblical requirement? Was the next question. What is my relationship to the church? Having seen what the Bible says about church membership. And how do I describe my relationship to the church? Well, you should be able to describe your relationship to the church. In the way you describe your relationship to your wife or your husband, in the way you describe your relationship to your children. And I say this when we speak of church membership, I hope and pray that when you speak of church membership, you speak of church membership with a sense of joy. I belong to a church, praise the Lord. That you speak with that joy. But you find people don't speak that way about church. There is no joy in them belonging to a church. They find no joy in the commitment, the responsibility, the accountability of the church. It's amazing, and I, 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 I hear people talk about, uh, see, when you ask somebody, uh, how was your marriage? Oh, I'm trying very hard. It's hard, you know, but we're getting there. And then you flip it around and see, have you watched Game of Thrones? Hey, yes, that was super lovely. Did you know what happened there? Did you see that what happened there? Game of Thrones and that episode? We're so excited about what happens on Netflix. We're excited about what happens on Amazon. We're excited about what happens in the Game of Thrones. I don't watch it. Maybe you don't watch it, but you kind of get the illustration. Folks are happy and excited about those things, but ask them about their marriage. Oh, yeah, you know, we're trying, you know. There's no excitement. We don't speak about our marriage that way. We don't speak about, oh, Pastor, you know what? It's hard, but praise the Lord. You know, it's, it's wonderful. This whole trying and testing is just wonderful. Praise the Lord. It, God's brought us to our knees, and you know, through this problem and situation and circumstance, God has brought us to our knees. Praise the Lord. We don't talk like that about our marriage. Why? Because we don't want to deal with accountability, responsibility, and commitment. And that same applies to the church. Are you a member of the church? No, I belong to the body of Christ. And there's no excitement in what it means to belong to the church. So we ask the questions again. Do I know what church membership is? Is church membership a biblical requirement? What is my relationship to the church? How do I describe my relationship to the church? You must be able to describe your relationship to the church. So I tried to answer those questions last week and I set out <clears throat> and made it very clear about the Catholic Church, the universal church, what that is, that you and I saved that we belong to the Catholic Church, we belong to the universal church. God called us into his church. The ecclesia or ecclesia is the called out ones. We've been called out of a community of sinners and called out of sin into being saints, into his kingdom, into God's family. We've been called out from one community to another community, from one family to another family. We've been called out from the lies to the truth, from darkness into light. We're the called out ones. And into this, into this, into this uh, church, into this Catholic church, into this body that we're called into, we're baptized into it, Paul says, by the Spirit. So that's how we belong to the body of Christ and true. When somebody says, as Christians, we belong to the body of Christ, we say, true. Absolutely, 100%, amen. That the body of Christ is made up of individual members in local communities from different tribes and tongues and nations across the geography of the world. They make up the body of Christ, make up the universal church, make up the Catholic church. And I spent time last week saying to you that, um, or showing you the different locations of the church. The church in Corinth, the church in uh, Galatia and other places made it very clear to you that there were different churches uh, geographically but all belonged to the body of Christ. And so it's important that you understand. I made also very clear to you, I gave you three um, Greek words that speak specifically about what it means to belong. And uh, um, if you got my notes, which you already have through email, uh, Achaios, somatikos, and melos, those three words bring, to, bring us to an understanding of what it means to belong, to be a part of a relationship. And that's what the local church is. That's what it means to belong to one another. 
to be accountable to one another, to be submissive to one another, to be responsible for one another. In Galatians 6.2, it says we have to bear one another's burdens. In James 5.15, it says, Therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. A prayer of a righteous person, when it is, uh, when it is brought about, can accomplish much. And so you find this, this great, I- I- intensely personal relationship, one with another, in the local church. Yet the local church, with other local churches, make up the body of Christ, make up the universal church. <clears throat> I went on to explain Hebrews 13, 17, and says, Obey them that have rule over you, and submit yourselves, for they watch out for your souls, so that you must, so they must give an account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. I made it very clear that, that that scripture cannot be fulfilled if you have the idea that you merely belong to the universal church and you can float around. That scripture can't be fulfilled in the ideas, in the mind of those, in the heart of those who say, well, I just belong to the body of Christ. I'm not accountable to anyone. I just float around. Why? Because it says in Hebrews 13, 17, obey them that have rule over you. Who's, who's he talking about? He's talking about the elders. And then he says, submit to them. Who? The elders. Submit yourselves to them. You've got two groups of people here. You've got the congregation of the lay people, and you've got those who rule over them, who are the elders. Submit to them. And you're not called to submit to elders in the USA or Nigeria or Ghana or other places. You're called to submit to where you meet, the elders there. So that they may watch out for your soul. That they may watch out for your soul. And then he says, to to not do this is unprofitable for you. I'm going to talk about that in another sermon. The great importance of what it means to be submissive to your elders. And ladies and gentlemen, I've got no problem in talking about being submissive to an elder or pastor. I will not bring anybody else into the church to talk about these matters. I'm not afraid to talk about it. I'm not afraid to say, as I I am your elder and you are to be submissive to me. I'm not afraid to talk about it. I'm not like other ministers who run away from these sorts of topics. Why? Because this is God's word. It's not my word. So I'm not afraid to talk about it. I'm not afraid to teach on it. I'm not afraid to talk about money. And we'll come to that part of church membership where money is important. Your money, what you do with your money in the church is important, as Paul tells us. And how you are, how you are to contribute financially for the, for the ongoing work of the church, for the maintenance of the church. I'm not afraid to talk about that. Why? Because it's God's word. And so you find Paul, uh, the, the writer of Hebrews says, Obey them that have rule over you and submit yourselves for they watch out for your souls as they must give an account that they may do it with joy and not with grief for that is unprofitable for you. And in this, in this local level where this is taking place, there is a joy here in that relationship. And then we said, on the matter of Matthew 18, let's pick up on Matthew 18 again, so leave Hebrews. Let's go to Matthew 18. We'll pick up on our text. We'll remind you again uh, uh, what it is uh, that I'm referring to. And then we'll, we'll forge forward on our journey. Matthew 18. Matthew 18 is an important text in a matter of uh, uh, church discipline. Uh, but also what I want you to see that Matthew 18 cannot exist. Matthew 18 can be, can't be fulfilled. Matthew 18 uh, is no reality if we're merely floating around as bodies belonging to the body of Christ. If we're merely floating around with no sense of responsibility, accountability and commitment to the local church, then Matthew 18 cannot be Uh, Sorry, cannot work in the church. And so Matthew 18, beginning at verse 15, if your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. And here here when we speak about when his brother sins, remember I told you in the the Greek that that word that talks about the familiarity we have with each other, that we call each other brother and sister. And so if your brother sins, go and show him his fault in private. And then if you find, you'll find my friends that it, it it is what we observe about each other here. It's not what you're observing about somebody else in another part of the world, but what you're observing on a local level. Um, so you're, you're observing that this man or this person, uh, this brother has sinned, or uh, uh, has sinned. He says, go and show him his fault in, in private. And what a beautiful thing this is. When somebody does wrong or has, has sinned against God, if, if you recognize that somebody is going down the path of unrighteousness, how loving it is to go to the brother and, or go to the sister and, sh- and say, hey, listen, I think what you're doing is wrong. It goes against God's law. How loving this is at the local level. Again, this can't be fulfilled if we are merely floating around 
as bodies in the body of Christ. This is only achieved and fulfilled at a local level. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. But if he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you, so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. And so here you see, who are they taking the two or three from? From the local congregation who knows this person. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. So which is the church here? Is it the Catholic church? Is it as in a sense of, you've got to tell the whole universal church, the whole Catholic church, what's happening? No. This is the local congregation who knows this person, You've sent one person, one person has gone and uh, tried to appeal to them to, to depart from sin, to repent. It's not worked. You take somebody else from the congregation. They go and speak to them. It hasn't worked. Then tell it to the local congregation. Tell it to the local congregation. And if he re refuses even to listen to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Now, th this is a matter of church discipline uh, and, and excommunication in a sense. Yeah, you, we, have to, we have to put that person out. We have to not regard them as members of the church anymore. This is serious stuff. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. I, I, I went on to, to speak about that last week. I'm sure you can remember if you were here. If you're not here, just catch up on the sermon online. So membership here is important. Even looking at the matter of church discipline, we don't, we don't regard this particular text as body of Christ discipline. We regard it as church discipline at a local level. And if it, if it takes place all over the churches, or in all the churches in the body of Christ, then that's what should happen. And you find even there, I, I, I do not know if there's any church in Bristol that has on their doctrinal statement church discipline as we have. I do not think I, I may... I'm, I think I may be, if I'm mistaken, please tell me if there's another church in Bristol that has church discipline on their doctrinal statement, on what we believe and what we teach, church discipline. I don't think so. Why? Because ministers, again, are scared to talk about this, but this is what is involved in church membership. Not that we want to ex excommunicate somebody and we get great joy from it and have a sort of a, a ha -ha laughter about it. You know, we've done this thing. No. This is a matter of, of bringing this, the member of the body of Christ to see his sin and to depart from his sin and come back to the Lord. It's loving, it's kind. It's what needs to be done so that you can restore such a believing one um, back to the Lord, back to the church and his calling. And so you find then that membership, being, uh, membership is important. Again, there are no exact scriptures directing a person to do a membership course or to fill in a membership form. Uh, but we see examples um, uh, uh, in the text uh, from uh, a scripture to show the great benefit of belonging to the local church. And I shared that with you last week, and I'll share more with you uh, today. So look at, look at me at... Um, so, 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. The things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses... And trust these to faithful people, men who will be able to teach others also. Interesting text, Paul speaks here with uh, Timothy, his young protege, his up-and-coming pastor. And, and he teaches him these things. He says, the things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, and trust these to faithful people, faithful men, who will be able to teach others also. Now, there's a couple of words here. It's first he says, and trust. And then he says, faithful men or faithful people. And the next point is, who will be able to teach now, what do we know from this? Well, what Paul is saying here to Timothy is, uh, and what we can recognize from this is, is very simple, very easy. You get it. You know what he's saying. These things which you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, and trust these to faithful men who will be able to teach you these things. Now, you, the word entrust here means to, to commit to somebody. To commit something to somebody. You cannot entrust somebody that you do not know. How do you trust somebody? Well, the more you are with them, the more you're in relationship with them, the more you see how they work, how they think, how they live, the more you get to know them. So you can't entrust something to somebody you do not know. That's foolish, right? Now, Paul is very clear in what he's saying here. Concerning the matter of the kingdom, concerning the matter of God's word, and the ruling and the running of his church, of the church, you are to entrust these things, these things to certain people. 
The point I'm making here is that if we're merely bodies floating around in the body of Christ and not accountable, responsible, and committed to the local church, if membership means nothing for us on that level, then we can't gain and earn trust amongst each other. Trust comes by spending time together. Trust comes by being committed together. Trust comes by being responsible together. Trust comes by being accountable together. So it says, these things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, and trust these to faithful people, faithful men. Again, if you're merely moving around, if people are merely moving around, I, I, it could be that I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here, that you know this already. But maybe it's good that you're reminded of this, that you can share with somebody else. And I've got no problem with repetition here today. So faithful people, how do you know somebody's faithful with something? Well, you don't, you don't know somebody's faithful with something over a, a, a meeting of one time. No, you know somebody's faithful over something when you spend time with them. When you look at their lives, when you're in relationship with them. You notice their faithfulness or lack of faithfulness or unfaithfulness. You notice how committed they are to something, whether they can be trusted or not. And so, <coughs> Paul is making clear here what needs to be, Paul is making clear here what needs to be um, committed to um, people and we are to do it we are to do it at a local level and uh, we are to find these faithful people we are to entrust to these faithful people what Timothy has heard from Paul this is precious look with me at um, I'm not sure if I've got it on my slide okay here we go Titus Titus chapter 1 Titus chapter 1 for this reason I left you I left you in Crete that you would set in order what remains and appoint elders in every city as I directed you. Namely, if a man is beyond reproach and the husband of one wife, having children who believe, not accused of any indecent behavior or rebellion and so forth, he goes on. Now, Paul directs Titus here to set in order a church. What does it mean? It, 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 it's a directive to be well organized. In the Greek here, the set in order is the, is the Greek word from where you get the English word orthodontist. Now, orthodontist is the one who sets your teeth straight. So you can see what Paul is saying here, to set straight that which is crooked, to set straight that which is out of order. Put it in order. Now you can't put it in order if all the people that he's speaking to are thinking for themselves, well, we're just, we're just loose bodies just floating around. You can't get any order in that. There is chaos in that. There is dysfunction in that. But that's, what, what, that's not what Paul is saying here. Paul is saying we have to set, he used to set these things straight, set them in order. And he's to appoint elders in every city as I directed you. So everywhere there's a church, there has to be an elder. So see, elders, elders responsible for the local congregation, yet all belonging to the body of Christ. Forgive me if I labor the point more when you already know it. So the directive here is to be well organized. He is to choose men uh, to elder the church, to lead the church. How is he to choose uh, if they're not known by the believers? Imagine, imagine we got up here one day and we said, okay, we, we, we've now chosen uh, 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 this man called Sam or Peter or whatever, and he's going to be now be your elder. And you guys go, what? We, we've not seen him. He's only been here once a year. Or oh, he comes once a month. Or he comes whenever he can. How will that look to you? What will that look like to you? No, but when we choose somebody, it's somebody that you know. You say, ah, we, have, we entrust this man. We trust this man. We see he's faithful. But faithful in what? Listen, faithful in what? We go back to the household. The greatest tragedy in the church is for a pastor to pick an elder who's gifted in the church, but useless at home. I made that mistake in the previous church. We had 19 leaders in our old church. 19 leaders. Biggest problems were in the house and not in the church. Wives, wives, that did not, wives that did not know how to submit. Men that did not know how to catechize and lead their families. Children who were insubordinate, not in submission and in rebellion. And so Paul says, yeah, this is what you need to do. You need to look at the home. And how are you to look at the home if the children are not there? Well, you're gonna, it, there has to be this relationship between the elder and the congregants, a relationship we have one with another. So Paul says you have to look into the home to see how this man runs his home. Why? Because in Timothy and Titus, it ends like this. If a man knows how to steward his own household well, he can steward the church well. So what, is the, what are these two men to do? What is 
Timothy and Titus to do. They had to take a magnifying glass and look intimately at who the man is. They had to, they had to look in detail about his own life to see whether he qualifies to be an elder. And that requires a relationship one with another. That requires on both parties responsibility, accountability, and commitment. So you see the importance here. The point I'm making is that there is a commitment to each other on a local level. So you can't, you can't be a floating body in the body of Christ because then this scripture doesn't work. This scripture works when every believer in Christ recognizes that we belong to the Catholic Church, we belong to the Universal Church, but the Universal Church, the Catholic Church, is made up of individual congregations from many tribes and tongues and nations and people groups. Now we get to the point here where we speak of uh, um, commendation. Now I decided last week to bring this series to you because we had this most beautiful event last week where we put a scroll in the hand of our brother and we said, take this letter, take this scroll to the church that you're going to. And so he did. Sent me a picture last week where that was presented to the church and the pastor prayed with them and received them into fellowship. What a beautiful thing that is. That we can send a letter of commendation. Now you cannot send a letter of commendation for somebody that you do not know. When you look for people to give you a reference, what do you look for? Those who know you. You can't ask a stranger on the street or you can't ask, okay, let's leave the stranger out. Imagine you, you, you're in the body of Christ and uh, uh, you're, in a, you're, in, you're, in, you're in the body of Christ, you're saved into the body of Christ, you're baptized into the, into the body of Christ, but you ask somebody on the other side of the city to write you a reference from, an, from another believer in the body of Christ to write you a reference. They can't do that because they don't know you. They can only write what they know about you. It's not good enough to say, well, I'm, just, I'm, I'm a believer in the Lord because we know that there is coming a day that Jesus tells us in the book of Matthew that many will say to him, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? What did Jesus say? I never knew you. I know you're not. Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. So we recognize faithfulness in each other. We can recognize those, those characteristics in each other when we're in, in relationship with each other. Letters of commendation. And so we find, last week we did that. We sent a letter of commendation uh, with our brother. Now, this happened in, 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 uh, in the book of Acts. It happened in the early church. And uh, we have done it. And I, I don't know who else does it uh, you know, today. But I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a champion for this now. I'm saying we need to do this. When we send somebody somewhere, we need to send with them a letter of commendation. So whether on official business of the kingdom or whether um, moving to a new location or even visiting somebody in another place, letters of commendation would be sent. We find that in church history. All the way up even until the 20th century, we find that to be the case. Now look with me as I try to drive this point further into your heart. Look with me at Romans chapter 16. At the end of the book, we find this uh, most wonderful um, Commendation. Romans chapter 16. Paul begins like this. Well, Paul ends in this. When I say he begins, he begins the chapter. But this is how he ends the book. He says, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, who is a servant of the church which is at St. Crea, that you receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints, that you help her in whatever matter she may have need of. For she herself has, uh, has also been a helper of many, and of myself as well. Now, just that few verses is, is, is packed with so much that we can preach on. Let's pick out a few nuggets and gems here, specifically in context of church membership and commendation. Paul begins like this, I commend to you our sister. Who is he commending? A stranger? No, he's commending, look at the words, look at what he says, I commend to you our sister, our sister. Yes, we're all believers in the body of Christ in the sense that we can call somebody brother and sister on the other side of the world who is a believer in Christ. But this here, Paul says, he knows her personally. He knows her personally. He says, I commend to you our sister. And that's where the word commend comes in. He can commend because he knows her. He knows her. He spent time with her. 
How do we know that? It says that you receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints, and that you help her in every matter, whatever she may have need of. For she herself has been, of, of a, been a helper of many and of myself as well. That's what he says. Help her, and he's commending her because he's in relationship with her. What relationship? A mutual relationship, brother and sister. She's been of help to many people, but also of the apostle, Paul. And therefore, there's a great confidence here in the commendation, in sending this woman with the letter to Rome. And what trust he has given her, uh, what great responsibility she has upon her, that she carries with her the scroll, she carries with her the letter from Paul. And, and in that letter is the commendation that they receive her, probably in the same way that they would receive him. That, would, that they would not look at her as merely a woman going to deliver this letter, but somebody who has been entrusted with the letter. And you would see her as a servant, and here the word diakonos, uh, and this gives rise to uh, what we may interpret as a, f- a female deacon or deaconess. Uh, so uh, here the, the Phoebe is a, is a diakonos, is a, is a deaconess in a sense, of the church. And whether that was a, in an official capacity or not, we do not know. where Paul calls her a servant and he entrusts her. So the underlying truth here is that um, these are not just floating bodies. Phoebe is not just a floating body with no sense of belonging, no sense of responsibility, accountability, or commitment. No, the reason that they were commended with letters is that they belong to the local congregation. And the local congregation knew them and therefore were able to send them with these letters. They could send a letter of commendation because the believers were uh, known to each other, and they were of good standing, and that's the word you probably need to learn or know in the middle of my sermon here, in good standing. Because I'll ask the question in a few moments. The word is good standing. In fact, it has been well noted over the centuries, in, in England especially, that true believers when visiting another church in another location, in another part of the country, would carry with them a letter of commendation from the church they came from to the church they were going to. Even if they were just visiting uncle and auntie or brother or sister in another city, and they found themselves, they must have said, well, we're going to be there for the weekend and we can't travel back. And we know the Lord's Day is upon us in the weekend. And we can't be in our own church for the, for the Lord's Day. So we'll, we'll visit our brother and sister's church on the Lord's Day. But here's what we're going to do. We're going to take a letter of commendation from our church to the minister of that church. So that why? When we come to the Lord's Supper, uh, we have a letter of commendation to say that we're in good standing with our church. Remember, part of the responsibility of the, of the leader of the church, and I'll talk about this when we come to the Lord's Supper and uh, baptism uh, regarding church membership. Uh, the responsibility of the elder is to guard the table. What does it mean to guard the table? It means to make sure that those who are coming to the table fully understand why they're coming to the table and how they come to the table, but also it is not for unbelievers. Now, if somebody walks through the door and, and you don't know whether they're believers or not, you, you don't have time to talk to them at the door. You don't have time to, in a sense, quiz them, uh, to ask the intriguing uh, you know, questions about their faith and the gospel and things like that so that they can come to the table. No, so they would carry a letter from their church and the one, the one who's greeting them would welcome them. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to our congregation. And they'll be presented with a scroll and they open it and they say, Oh, here is a person in good standing with the church. And they welcome. They would come to the Lord's Supper. The letter would say that the one visiting is in good standing with the church. In good standing with the church. Go further to the right. Um, Let's look at Colossians. At Colossians 4, Colossians 4 um, begins like this. Masters, grant to your slaves justice and fairness, knowing that you too have a master in heaven. Then verse 2, devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving. Praying at the same time for us as well. Look at here, the responsibility they have to each other. To pray for who? For themselves, to devote themselves to prayer, 
But pray for one another that the God will open, open to us a door for the word so that we may speak for the mystery of Christ for which I have also been in prison that I may, take it, I may make it clear in the way I ought to speak. And then conduct yourselves with wisdom uh, to, toward outsiders making the most of the opportunity. Let your speech always be with grace as seasoned with salt so that you will know how you should respond to each person. Then look at verse 7. As to all my affairs, Tychicus, um, our beloved brother and faithful servant and fellow bond servant in the Lord will bring you information. For I have sent him, I have sent him to you for this very purpose that he may know about our circumstances and that he may encourage your hearts and with Onesimus, our faithful and beloved brother, who is one of your number, they will inform you about the whole situation. What Paul is saying here is he's sending somebody to the congregation, but he's commending them. He's saying who they are. He's describing their relationship not only with him as the apostle, but their relationship to the church and to the Lord. He's commending these, names, these men. He's naming them. What does he say? As to all my affairs, Tishik is our beloved brother and faithful servant and fellow bond servant in the Lord. Faithful servant and fellow bond servant? This is, this is him describing a man in a very deep and intimate way. He knows this man. They've served together on the front line. They've been in the midst of battle. They know what it is to pray together. They know what it is to cry together. They know what it is to have joy together. They know what it is to preach together. They know what it is to go through persecution together. And therefore Paul can write in this way, our beloved brother and faithful servant. You cannot be called faithful. It is, listen, brothers and sisters in Christ. It is somebody else who calls you faithful. You don't call yourself faithful. In the same way, you need someone else to call you humble rather than you calling yourself humble. Humbleness is what another person recognizes about you. Faithfulness is what somebody else recognizes about you and not you yourself. It would be good if somebody says about you that you're faithful. It would be good if somebody says about you that you're humble. But if you're saying it about yourself, I would have cause for concern. And so when others know you to be faithful, when others know you to be humble, then they speak that way. And here Paul is speaking of this brother. He calls him a beloved brother, very close, very intimate, and a faithful servant. He's recognized in what he's done. He's faithful, he's uh, responsible, accountable, and committed in what he does. And a bond servant, a doulos, bond doulos in the Lord, a bond slave in the Lord. He will bring you information for I have sent him for this very purpose. And Paul sends him here. This is a letter of commendation. So I ask you today, as I, before I proceed to the next part of my sermon, I ask you today, on the matter of good standing, are you in good standing with the church? Are you in good standing with the church? The question doesn't end there if you have an answer, because you will have to show, you will have to show how you are in good standing with the church. And that brings into play the question of what is my relationship with the church? How do I describe my relationship with the church? Let's look at a further example of a letter sent. Uh, let's go to the left again at the book of Acts. Uh, isn't it marvelous to go, to go through God's word, to flip page by page and see that which is inspired, that which is theanostos, that which is God breathed to us. What a great joy we have to go through these pages because this is the word of the living God. How exciting it is that we get to read God's heart here. We get to hear God's thoughts we get to see his will and testament for us. Acts chapter 15. Great joy. We turn the pages with joy. We look at it with joy. We say, oh Lord, teach us and show us. So here in Acts chapter 15 is the matter of the Jerusalem council. And a matter of a letter sent. Some men, it says in chapter 15, beginning in verse 1, some men came down from Judea and began teaching the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And when Paul and Barnabas had, had, had uh, had great dissension and debate with them, the brethren determined that Paul and Barnabas and some others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders concerning the issue. So you can already see here, before we even go to the letters, we can see an accountability and a responsibility and a commitment to each other. That these men are listening to other men. They're listening to other faithful men. And so he says... Verse 2 says, And when Paul and Barnabas had, had great uh, dissension and debate with them, the brethren determined that Paul and Barnabas and some others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders concerning this issue. So they go to Jerusalem. 
Therefore, being sent on their way by the church, they were passing by through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail a conversion of the Gentiles and were bringing great joy to all the brethren. And when they arrived at Jerusalem, they were received by the church there. This is, not the, this is not the universal church. This is Yes, it is the universal church in a sense that it is a local church that belongs to the universal church or makes up the universal church. But this is a geographically located church in Jerusalem. And they were received by the church there in Jerusalem and the apostles and elders there and they reported all that God had been done, done with them as they traveled on their journey. So what did they do? They reported. Again, it's a matter of responsibility. What a great joy I had yesterday. There are many people not here today. And when you don't get to church or you don't understand your responsibility in church, a brother who sits here, the, the elder brother, uh, who's been a deacon of this church before we took over, Send me a message every time he does. He sends me a message. Dear brother, I will not be in church tomorrow. I am going to spend the day with my son. By God's grace, I will see you next week. What a great joy that brings. How wonderful it is to have that sort of accountability and responsibility and commitment. I will not be in church tomorrow. In other words, he's saying, when you look out there and you find my church, my seat empty, don't be worried. It's all well. In fact, he even said so. He said, I'm not sick. <laughs> I'm going to visit my son. How marvelous that is. And why is it that we don't do that? Why is it that we don't do that? Oh, when you don't get to work, you're calling up and saying, Oh, I, I'm not coming to work today. I'm not feeling very well. Or whatever the case may be. But how is it that it doesn't take place in the church? How is it that it's lacking in the church? And here Paul says, Oh, sorry, they, they, they give a report. They give a report. Imagine this. Imagine this. This is... A man who's been called of God personally is giving a report to other men. He's telling other men what had happened on his journey. He could have said, well, you know, I, I don't need to tell anybody anything. I'm the one who's been called of God. I'm the one who heard God's voice. I'm the one who was personally called of God. I don't have to tell you anything. But does he do that? No. But some of the elect... Sorry, sorry, some of the sect of the Pharisees who had believed stood up saying, it is necessary to circumcise them and to direct them to observe the law of Moses. Verse 6, the apostles and the elders came together to look into this matter. And here's a wonderful thing, isn't it? When false teaching arises, when errors come into the church, if we're floating bodies, we cannot sort the problem out. We have to be accountable to sit down over the Bible and say, what does God's word say about this? So the apostles and elders came together to look into this matter, this matter of the circumcision. After there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brethren, you know that in the days God made it, that in early days God made a choice among you that by the mouth of the Gentiles uh, would hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God who knows the heart testified to them, giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did also to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, cleansing their hearts by faith. Now therefore, why do you put God to the test by placing upon the neck of a disciple a, a yoke which neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? We believe that we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus in the same way as they also are. So there's no distinction and Paul goes on to talk about it even in Galatians. When this matter arises again on the matter of circumcision. All the people kept silent and they were listening to Barnabas and Paul as they were relating what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. After they stopped speaking, James answered, saying, Brethren, listen to me. Simeon has related how God first concerned him. Let me repeat that. Simeon has related how God first concerned himself about talking from among the Gentiles, a people for his name. With this the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written. After these things I will return and I will build, a, build the tabernacle of David, which has fallen, and I will rebuild its ruins, and I will restore it so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord. And all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who makes these things known from long ago. So the reference here is to the Gentiles who God is, will call into salvation. Therefore it is my judgment that we do not trouble those who are turning to God from among the Gentiles but that we write to them that they may abstain from things contaminated by idols and from fornication and from what is strangled and from blood. And so they go on to, um, um, to write this letter and it says in verse 22, um, and then, then it seemed good to the apostles and elders that the whole church, and with the whole church to choose men from among them to send to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. This is a wonderful, glorious thing. Look how they deal with the issue. Look how they deal with it. 
I tell you, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, one of the biggest problems that we have in the church is when somebody raises an issue and then disagrees with something and then just runs off. We don't do that, do we? No, we have a responsibility. We're accountable. We're committed to one another. Uh, and then together to the, uh, our responsibility and commitment and accountability to, you know, to the Lord. That we, and it says here they even debated over this. That much talk over this. So that's a good thing. It's okay to debate over it. And come to the conclusion as God, God's word directs us in the conclusion we are to come to. And then as they came to the conclusion, it pleased the whole church to choose men from among them to send to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. So from Jerusalem to Antioch, another church. Jerusalem and Antioch. And they're all part of the universal church. Look at me in one more scripture. And then I'll... And then I'll I'll summarize. Look at 1 Peter, chapter 5. First Peter chapter 5, beginning at verse 1. We'll read verse 1 to verse 5. Therefore I exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ and a partaker of also of the glory that is to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily according to the will of God, and not for sordid gain, but with eagerness, nor yet as lording it over those allotted to your charge, but proving to be examples, of, examples to the flock, and when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. You younger men, likewise, be subject to your elders, and all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another. For God is opposed to the proud, but gives grace to the humble. What's the point of the text here? God says to the elders, says, therefore I exhort you, sorry, therefore I exhort the elders among you. So this is talking to the elders. I exhort the elders among you as your fellow elder, and witness of the sufferings of Christ, and a partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed, shepherd the flock among you, shepherd the flock among you, exercising oversight not under compulsion, but voluntarily according to the will of God, not for sordid gain, but with eagerness. What is he saying? He's saying to the elder who's responsible for the local congregation, how he is to lead that congregation. There's a shepherd and there's the sheep. Is the shepherd and the flock. Look at the language here. Look at the words being used here. There has to be a shepherd, a local shepherd, and there has to be a flock. If all of us belong to the body of Christ and we're just merely floating around one with another, how would you recognize who our shepherd is? And now we know our great and glorious shepherd. The text tells us who it is, Jesus Christ. But the shepherd whom God has appointed, the pastor, for that's what it is, the shepherd, is responsible for the local congregation according to God's structure for the church. How is he to know who the flock are? You are the flock here that gather every week in Lockleys in Bristol in the United Kingdom. I am not responsible. I am not to shepherd a flock in Clifton or Western Supermare. That's not my responsibility. I am to shepherd this flock. And there's a responsibility you have towards the shepherd in this flock. And so, and so Peter says, yeah, therefore I exhort the elders among you uh, as your fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ and partaker also of the glory that is to be revealed. Shepherd the flock among you, the, sh the flock among you, meaning those, when he says among you, he's talking about on a contextually local level. He doesn't say shepherd the flock on the other side of the world. He says shepherd the flock among you on the local level. Exercising oversight, not under compulsion. And he goes on to speak about how to do it, which is wonderful. So I hope you get the point there. What's the point of all this? Well, as you listen to this, maybe you're listening online or somebody listening here today will say, will say Certain, certainly we hear you, but we don't need the approval of men. Because all you're talking about here is being accountable, responsible, and committed to other people. We don't need to be approved by men, people say. Or we don't need the approval of men. People will say. Well, I say that certain brothers and sisters may be grieved by this. 
at the thought of being approved by other men. There is no doubt, as we set out to do this, that there can be within the church a Pharisaic attitude that could arise. And, and Peter makes it clear here when he says that when we do this, we are not to do it under compulsion, but voluntarily according to the will of God, not for sordid gain, but with eagerness, not to do it for anything that will build us up, but to do it for the glory of God. So we understand that this can happen, where this Pharisaic attitude of thinking we're better, we're over-shepherding or heavy-shepherding the flock and things like that, and we know that does happen. It does happen in the church, there's no doubt. But scripture also makes it clear that it is not always a bad thing to be committed, responsible, and accountable to another person. In fact, it is better for us to seek praise from others, like I said a few minutes ago, rather than seeking praise from our own lives. Proverbs 27.2 says, Let another man praise thee, and not your own mouth, and not with your own lips. Let another man speak of you. Let another man say of your faithfulness and your, how trustworthy you are and how accountable you are. And so in the matter of approval of men, I understand. But the text makes clear even through the apostle, through Peter, through the early church and all through church history, that they sought the approval of men. How? By being accountable to one another. Well, we have some questions at the end, well, or some comments, and people say, well, I don't need church. I don't need the church, people will say. I don't need the church. I can, I can just go from place to place. I don't need the church in the sense of what you're talking about here. I can just pray to God by myself. I don't need the church. Well, let me say to you, brothers and sisters in Christ, I need the church because I am weak. I need you because I am weak. And I'm asking you today, do you need me because you're weak? I say we need each other because we are weak. You see, when a person says they don't need to be a member of the church, they are, they are in essence saying, listen, I'm strong enough. I don't need you. I don't need you to pray with me. I don't need you to carry my burden. I don't need to confess my sin to you. I'm just fine by myself. I'm strong by myself. I say, my brothers and sisters in Christ, that is a trap of the devil. I am not strong. <laughs> I am weak. I need you. I need my fellow brethren. I need my sisters in Christ to pray with me, to stand with me, to bear my burdens, to come close, to cry with me, to mourn with me, to have joy with me. For I am weak. Well, <coughs> others would say, well, I'm looking for the perfect church. Well, this church that I'm coming to right now, well, this doesn't look like the perfect church. I'm, I'm looking for the perfect church. So when I find that perfect church, I'll be a member of that church. Well, as somebody rightly said, I don't know who it is, rightly said a few years ago, or centuries ago, I don't know. He said, if you're looking for the perfect church, don't join it because as soon as you join it, you'll spoil it. You'll spoil it because you are imperfect. And by all accounts, there is no perfect church. Does that mean there's no hope? No, listen carefully. There are no perfect churches, but there are very many healthy churches. There are healthy churches. What does it mean? Churches that preach God's word. Churches that know what membership is. So there are healthy churches, but there are no perfect churches. So stop looking for a perfect church. You're not going to find it. I say to those who come and talk to us, I say, you know, we're a bunch of ex-convicts. Come to our church. Why? Because we, you can sit with ex-convicts. Really? You have murderers in your church? Shh, well, yeah, ex-murderers. Who do they murder? Well, Jesus says, if you speak to someone with anger in your heart, it's the same as murder. We're ex-murderers. We've got ex-fornicators, ex-porn addicts, ex-liars and thieves. What are we doing? What have we, what have we done? We're ex-convicts. We're convicts because we broke God's law. We're criminals. And God, by His amazing grace, saved us. So we're ex-criminals now. We're ex-convicts. Jesus having set us free, paying the price. So there is no perfect church, but there are very many healthy churches. <coughs> it's the same way that when, he, when people speak about marriage, when you ask a man or a woman, even within the church, well, you find it a lot outside the church, this sort of rhetoric, 
When you ask, why aren't you married yet? Or what are you looking for in a marriage? I said, well, I haven't found the perfect man yet. Or I haven't found the perfect woman yet. Now, you may find nothing wrong with that. I find everything wrong with it. Why? Because of what I just said a few seconds ago. Here is an imperfect man looking for a perfect woman. Or a perfect, imperfect woman looking for a perfect man. It doesn't work. Marriage is two imperfect people joined together. <laughs> That's what it is. Two imperfect people joined together. You cannot find a perfect woman and neither can you find a perfect man. There will be perfection in the, in the consummation of all things. when we stand before his great and glorious presence on that day. Before that, we are imperfect people joining together with imperfect people for the glory of God. So there is no perfect church, but there's a healthy church. In fact, the Westminster Confession on paragraph 25, I'm not sure if I have it here. Um, oh no, I don't have it. The Westminster Confession on paragraph 5 says, The purest churches under heaven are subject both to mixture and error. Some have so degenerated as to become no churches of Christ, but synagogues of Satan. Nevertheless, there shall always be a church on earth to worship God according to his will. So I'm very careful how I speak about the church. I'm very careful how I word a sentence about the church. Because though the church, although we recognize much error in the church in the broad sense, and we can't even be specific geographically about certain churches being in error, the truth is there is a true church. There is a healthy church. There is a church that is God's, of which he is the head. So nevertheless, there will always be a church on earth to worship God according to his will. Well, as we come to the close, we say, well, what about the fact that I'm scared? Well, I don't want to join the church. I'm scared, pastor. Why? Because I've been hurt before in the church. Well, you're going to continue to be hurt. Why? Because it's imperfect people. You're not going to find a perfect church where you're going to be free from hurt. The only place you're going to be free from hurt and pain and sorrow and disease and wipe away every tear from your eye is in that place. You're not going to find it here. Like in any relationship, you're bound to rub somebody up the wrong way to get hurt. And so it is with the church. Somebody won't greet you. Somebody won't say hello to you. Somebody will misinterpret what you've said. It becomes a big issue. So you're not going to find a perfect church. You, are you going to, you, I'm scared. I've been hurt before in the church. I don't want to put my name down on a piece of paper to say I want to be a member because I've been hurt before. Folks, let me just say this to you, and I'm not here to tell you my story. For the number of times I've been hurt, I shouldn't belong to a church. I shouldn't even be preaching. I should say, let me go home. You have no idea sometimes what it is to be a pastor and to be hurt by people. We're constantly through your mind. I was sharing with a, a brother recently, and I was saying to him, I was actually sharing with a, you know, Brother Bernard, and I was saying to him, when I said, when I said to him, when you leave, please don't, please don't stop being my friend. And he said, no, Pastor, I will, not, I will not stop being your friend. And I said that out of experience because I've had men close to me, men close to my family, men so close to us in the church, that when they left, they stopped being our friends. They stopped being our friends. So you find there's hurt there. When somebody walks away from a church without saying anything, but will go around and tell somebody else, oh, this pastor said this, but they don't speak to you personally about it, and the word gets back to you, it hurts you. It hurts. Why didn't you come and speak to me? Why didn't you talk about these things? They go and tell somebody else. It hurts. So will it continue to hurt? Yes. Will it continue to cause me pain? Yes. In the same way, it'll continue to hurt you and cause you pain. Why? Because it's imperfect. We're imperfect people. We will do the wrong thing. But we'll try to do the right thing by coming together, speaking about it, and seeking God's word that we may find the, the truth. Well, what about this? I'm waiting to sort my own life out before I join the church. I'm waiting to sort my own life out. Then I'll become a member of the church. Well, there's a problem with that. There's a problem with that. What's the problem? When somebody says to me, I'm waiting to sort my own life out before I join the church, what you're saying is that you want to join the place that's already perfect, that we are people who have already got our lives sorted out. Not true. <laughs> Not true. Every one of us here today has something in our life that we haven't sorted out yet. Why? It's called progressive sanctification. We've been transformed more into the likeness of Jesus Christ. It is a journey that we're on. 
We're pilgrims through this land, going towards our celestial city and getting better and better every day. Abiding in word and spirit, getting better and better every day. So when you say, I'm waiting to sort my life out, you're making the assumption that the people that you're joining are already got, already got their life sorted out. I say, certainly not. Well, what about those who are drifters and shoppers? Well, the drifters and shoppers are those who will come and go as they please. They're drifters. Exactly that. Drift from one place to the next. And they will soak up what they can for a while, soak up all that they can get from it, and then they'll go and leave and go to the next place. Now, I've seen that in the church. I've seen that. And then it's... And I know it'll continue, it'll continue to happen. It's not something we can stop. They get bored of, after a while, or they will find something that they will disagree with, and say, well, I'm going to go on to the next place. Or find something cuts at their conscience, and then realize, oh, I, I want nothing to do with this anymore. And they walk away. They drift again. Those are the drifters. They don't want to commit. They don't want to be responsible or accountable. So they're merely drifting from place to place. A very hippie type of mentality. Very hippie type of mentality. I'll set up my camp wherever I want. And when I'm ready to leave, I'll just leave. Well, what about those who are shoppers? Well, drifters and shoppers. Drifters go from place to place. Shoppers, very, very similar attitude. The shoppers, the shoppers are the ones who are saying, well, let me see what you have to offer me today. I'll just shop around. I'll go from one place to the next and I'll shop around. And as I said last evening, in Bristol or any city in this United Kingdom or in the nations of the world, you will find churches of various cultures and kinds, various uh, attitudes and philosophies, various gizmos and gadgets that will suit any kind of need that you may have. Every fad and fantasy that you think man can have, there's a church for that. If you're looking for a church with all sorts of music and impressive choirs, there's loads of them in Bristol. If you're looking for a church that appeals to a particular culture and language, you can find them in Bristol. Amongst a certain group of people, there's a sub-dialect of languages that you can go to. And they'll speak only that language in the, in the service. And you can go to another place where they speak a different language and so forth and so on. And culturally, uh, and nationally, um, you can go to find the churches that you like. You can shop around. And so we have these drifters and shoppers that go around from place to place looking for what they can find. And they will always ask, well, what do you have to offer me? What can you give me today? What can I benefit from being a part of this congregation? Well, those are the drifters and shoppers. I concluded this, my brothers and sisters in Christ. The people of God I described in the Bible, and I did so in my first two sermons, the, the part one and part two. The people of God are described in the Bible as flock, building, and body. That's how we described. Flock, building, and body. One sheep does not make a flock. One brick does not make a building. One limb does not make a body. We need many sheep to make a flock. We need many bricks to make a building. We need many limbs to make a body. Amen. What is your relationship to the church? How should it be? Well, it should be something like this. That you would come one day to the crown. That you would come one day to the conclusion of this. This is our church covenant. It's part of our policy for the church to come into membership. And this is what you openly proclaim. We openly proclaim this. We acknowledge the Lord Jehovah, the only true and living God, to be our God in Christ, in Jesus Christ, through the eternal covenant which has been revealed to us in the gospel upon which we have taken hold of taken hold for life and salvation, giving ourselves to the Lord to be his people. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and in obedience to his revealed will, we covenant together to give ourselves solemnly and prayerfully to the Lord and to one another so that we may perform the duties required of a church of Christ. And this we do relying entirely upon the free grace, the precious blood and righteousness of our Savior, the assistance of the Holy Spirit, and the many promises of help given to us in Holy Scripture. We desire and resolve Oh, sorry, our desire and resolve is to make God's glory our end and God's word our rule in all worship and practice. We will therefore endeavor to obey the laws of God's house, walking together in observance of Christ's holy ordinance and binding ourselves to love each other, to seek each other's spiritual welfare and to work for mutual peace and prosperity. 
We call both heaven and earth to witness this solemn covenant with God and with each other. And we fervently pray that God will grant us his blessing as a Christian church under the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. That is our, our covenant, our church covenant that we teach concerning our membership. And you will see that it encompasses not merely being accountable to a man in a sense. I'm not, saying, not just saying I'm answerable to a man. It encompasses the multi-layer multi of what it means to be a member of the body of Christ. Let's pray.